Welcome to the Beza Performance live stream. At Beza, we do executive disciplines for organizations that want to be world class. I'm Marshall Henley, the president of Beza Performance, and today is SNOP Thursday, the second and fourth Thursday of every month when we get to interview my friend Doug Dedman, president of DBM. Uh, we use DBM for all of our SNOP implementations. Welcome, Doug, again. Oh, good to be here again, Marshall. Always look forward to these. Yeah, they're kind of fun. So uh, let, let me remind everybody kind of our our fundamentals. Uh, we're going to be talking about demand planning and how uh, unconstrained demand and uh, constraints intersect in SNOP, but we want to kind of anchor in the uh, the fundamentals of how we view SNOP. So we see SNOP as the president's handle on the business, and it is essentially a strategy link uh, between strategy and execution, I should say. Decisions need to be made as, as part of SNOP to set the flow rate for the business by family by constraint-based family in our thinking. And it should be actionable and establish clear accountabilities for those actions. Um, you know, who owns which demand streams, who owns the supply for each family. And then uh, from a discipline standpoint, it should be regular and repeatable as a management process. Uh, the, the executive should be involved in it, not just in the executive SNOP meeting, but in supporting the decision, the execution of the decisions that are made during the executive SNOP meeting. And then finally, the, the process itself should allow the business to improve and the process itself should improve as uh, time goes on. You should get better at SNOP the more you do SNOP. So That's exactly right. <laughs> so with that said, today we're going to kind of continue discussing demand streams. Um, we've we've kind of done two of these on those and we've gotten to the point where we want to talk about the idea of unconstrained demand and inter how it intersects constraints for a, for a constraint view of that demand or, or a shipment uh, plan. As a matter of fact, it, let me just start there. From a hot topic standpoint, uh, I think most of our clients would say this is right now, especially this is the big deal, right? I've got unconstrained demand. No way we're going to be able to service everyone. Um, so how are we going to do it? Why, why is that in your view, such an important topic right now. And well, yeah, you kind of hit on it there, Marshall. It's, uh, I mean, you pretty much have to be living under a rock the last uh, yeah. you know, couple of years um, for, or, or be one of those very, very fortunate few companies that I haven't yet run into where um, you, they've got more demand than what they have capability to supply. So whether or not it's uh, un unable to get, uh, um, resources from a production standpoint, whether it's supply chain issues, which is the one that a lot of people are facing right now. Everybody's kind of in this this point that, hey, we've got to deal with, you know, how do we actually constrain our demand? And uh, because we are constrained on the supply side. And ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've said this several times on this uh, live cast, if you can't build it, you can't sell it, right? Um, right. And uh so, so that's that's the big thing, and it's it's a it's a really important topic, and it, it it's, it's it's especially important when we start thinking about SNOP and those bullet points that you kind of hit off at the yeah. beginning of how we look at the executive SNOP process. So maybe it would be good to um, I think you had a graphic you could put up that was from the last time we we met um, to help people kind of understand how we think of the process in terms of flow of meetings and that kind of stuff and. Do we have that that we can fire up for? Everybody? Well, yeah, I thought I thought maybe it might make sense to start a little bit with like okay, like we we talked a little. That was kind of conceptually, I guess. What okay. uh, you know how we think about SNOP and constraining, right. but like so, how do those things intersect at kind of a high level? And and, and really, I, I kind of wanted to make maybe four points on this that okay. I will kind of enfold the the conversation that we go forward. So I, I do have a slide. So if you want to pull that up, there you go. So um, constraining demand and SNOP, um, you know, what should you really expect um, to get out of, uh, you know, the constraining process or what, how should those two things intersect? And I would say in your SNOP process, it should be clear if you need to constrain demand. In other words, you know, we've talked about this, Marshall, many times. It's like, yeah. you know, SNOP doesn't magically fix everything for you. But it sure should make it so that you can't hide from the decisions that you have to make, right? It's a, it should be your reality. And so it should be clear if you need to constrain demand. And that should yeah. be out of the SNOP process. And everybody should be in agreement with that. Yeah. I would say 
The second part of that is it should be clear if you've constrained demand in the past, right? So is this an ongoing thing um, where you've, you know, you constrained demand uh, the last few months? You, you want to know that, right? Because mm-hmm. when you start to look at your performance as you move forward, right? Uh, sometimes it's really easy to forget where we were a month ago or two months ago or three months ago. Um, and then we start to question the plans that got put together by the demand side of the organization or the plans that got put to, put together from the supply side of the organization. It's good to know um, if you've constrained in, in, in the past. Um, and this is especially good as you look forward and you start thinking about some of those strategic decisions around mm-hmm. uh, new, new customer pursuits and all of those sort of things. Um, the third thing on that, the SNOP process should drive to decisions on how you constrain demand, right? Constraining demand doesn't just happen in a vacuum. There are actual activities that you have to do to do that. that right. if, I, if I don't have the product, somebody's not going to get what they want when they want it. And it might be good to make a decision about who that is. Right. And sometimes <laughs> what's even worse than not getting what they want when they want it is not getting what they want when we promised it to them. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, which is a real big issue. I mean, that's probably the biggest distinction between on this particular topic between right now and three years ago. We had lots of people with constrained supply three years ago, but they, they had a much better handle on their promise date. Uh, yeah, you know, their their customer experience numbers, whatever whatever metric you apply to that, PD, yeah. PDSL. The, the the last thing on this, I would say, from an intersection of constraining demand into SNOP, is it should show the impact. The SNOP process should show the impact of constraining demand, right? Because if you constrain demand, there's a you know what happens. It potentially increases your backlog, right? Um, and so you, you need to be able to, to see that um, and, and the results of those decisions. So kind of at a high level, those are the, the pieces I think about for SNOP. And, and to kind of dovetail that back to, you know, the overarching idea of SNOP, it's about, you know, taking control of the business, right. um, you know, and, and if you think about those four things that I have up there specifically re- related to constraining, you know, if if the process shows those things, you know, that, that's a big part of controlling this aspect uh, of, of the business, the constraining yeah. aspect. Good. Yeah, I'm glad you did that. Uh, that's a good way to think about it. So um, I guess we had talked a bit about this idea of constraining as a process, like there's discrete steps and decisions. Do you have uh, some stuff you could share with with folks for that? I think that's the meat that they might be looking for. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah, the, the, okay, that's great, Doug, great concepts, <laughs> blah, 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 you know, great. I'm, I'll leave and I'll go with those. It's kind of, how do you actually get that to happen in SMP, yeah, right? Like right. <laughs> a little bit of the nuts and bolts. And I think this is kind People of what you're processing tools. Right, exactly. So if it, this is probably what you're referring to before. And maybe if you can pull up the screen again, I'll, I'll maybe jump through this a little bit. So, you know, we, we, and if you haven't, if you don't remember, or if this is all new to you, you can go back. I think those other live streams, Marshall, they're up there. You can mm-hmm. see, we talked through this in a bit more detail, but if, if you look at this particular diagram, real simple, we have this unconstrained view up here. We have a constrained view down here. Your customer lives above the line. You live below the line, right? Customer doesn't care necessarily what your constraints are. They want what they want when they want it. Um, and really, you're trying to figure out how to balance limited resources to make that happen. And so that's where SNOP kind of kind of fits in there. And, and really, there's three things. I'm only going to show two on this because the third one is so intertwined with these two. And this is slightly different than how I showed it in the past. Yeah, but that's fine. Uh, I, I reserve the right to change any of my diagrams <laughs> at any time. So <laughs> no problem. So, Yeah. So the two things I put on here are really process and structure. The third thing is people. How do people interact with the SNOP process and how do they interact with with the structure? 
Um, and so when we're thinking about constraining and we think about the process, right, you can look at that and go, OK, so this is a fairly standard. Uh, if, if you've read any SNOP books, you yeah. know, and people will ask the question, oh, why do we have to have all these meetings? Well, there's a there's a specific reason for a couple of these meetings, and they actually dovetail very nicely into this discussion of constrained versus unconstrained. Mm -hmm. Because the first part of that meeting is the arrival at the SNOP, the demand plan. And you can think about that demand plan as uh, the collection or the culmination of all your other demand planning activities to develop an, a totally unconstrained demand plan, right? That's your and chance then, to really ask what if we could meet the Yep. Yep, it's 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 that external market facing view versus the internal. Now, operations can be part of that discussion, but I, I can tell you there's been many times where I've sat in those demand meetings and they get taken over by the operations side right. of the business. Um, and typically what I see in that case is it's almost like you've you've uh, you've led the witness, if you will. Right. Where yeah. we, we've already started constraining. Um but before we kind of figured out what does the what does the demand look like, um, and so this is really the output of that is the unconstrained demand plan, and you're going to see it in a minute that that's got to be two pieces. One is bookings, and the other one is shipments, and it is the ownership of of sales or sales and marketing to get that done, and also to highlight as part of that process. What are their major assumptions in those demand plans? Because that, you know, everything going forward is always driven off of a series of assumptions. This is what we think is going to happen. Yeah. It's those assumptions that really, you know, are undergirding the plan. That's all going to be part of this. And just to make sure we're homogenous with everybody in terms of their own internal terminology, bookings is the sale. It might be POs. It might be what you expect for POs. It can be forecast too, but it's essentially the, the, what you, what you're going to, what you're going to take in orders and then shipments would be the unconstrained plan for when you're going to deliver those before you yep. pass it through the, okay. Yep. So, so think about call it shipments, as, some people call sales. I, I just want to be careful. With right. That, right. Yeah. I, I like to think about it as, you know, kind of from more of, of a product based manufacturing background is yeah. the, the, the orders, uh, the bookings are order inflow and the shipments are really order outflow or product outflow, right? And yet, yeah. you know, you need to have those orders coming in and product outflow being the shipments. So yeah. uh, I think I think from a racy standpoint, we can say, I, maybe you don't want to cover this, but that you can own as the sales team or the people who are responsible for getting orders can own both of those. They don't need the supply people to sign off because we're talking about the unconstrained view of the right. world. Okay. Yep. Yep. And and really, you know, the process from the demand meeting then going down to the supply meeting, right? This is where I have to deal, I'm below the line. I'm dealing with my internal reality, whether that's inventory constraints, whether that's production constraints, supply chain constraints. I'm now dealing with the what can I do? This yeah. is what 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 could I do? This is what can I do? And then here in this pre-SNOP meeting is really where I, I deal with the constraint that came out of this operations meeting, mm -hmm. right? So, so and, and these are some of those tough decisions of what is the impact of that constraint and how do I see that? And this is where it becomes very important that I do have both of those aspects of demand, both bookings and shipments. So um, one of yep, the things that we, oh, sorry, one of the things we kind of led with when we when we published this on LinkedIn and, and YouTube was that if you kind of ignore those two steps, you do so at your peril. And we we run into a ton of co uh, companies with SNOP in, intact where they kind of blow through that and you really don't see the unconstrained view get much much view. <laughs> it's like, that's to your point, it sort of gets swamped immediately in the, in the flow of the process. This gives us a discrete pause between an unconstrained view of the world before we, you know, we do have to look at the constraints. That's not a problem, but we, we have a place there to ask how, how, I mean, ideally we, we would say, how can we meet the unconstrained view and, and, and execute it as, as it is uh, presented? 
Yeah, it's um, you know, I th- I, I think it's uh, if I if I really you know think through that, and and as we we've talked about this many many times, right? Is I I've got to be able to see both both things, right? I've got to I've got to be able to see. I've got to move through it. I've got to be real clear on where I'm at. Yeah. That actually comes back to the second part of this, which is really that structure, right? Right. And I put these two things together just because. Well, but I I bumped you off of executive SNOP. Did you, did you want to finish there before you or we? Oh, got... on the executive SNOP meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, just in terms of uh, of thinking through, like coming to those executive meetings and not really actually addressing the idea of it being constrained, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. This goes to that question of how can I tell it needs to be constrained? And I I mean, you've asked me several times, hey, how the heck can they be coming into their exec meeting and their production's way above their capability or their inventory is all negative? Like, uh, like who missed the boat on this? And part of that is at the end of this process, and and it does dovetail into the data a little bit, is because... When you look at SNOP, it's the culmination of a whole bunch of other planning activities that you do. It's the management process of that happens monthly. And the reason it happens monthly is because you can't do all this stuff all the time. Right. But what you're really trying to do is look back at what happened and, and look at all the work you've done to prepare your demand plan to say, hey, what does this look like when I aggregate that up? And, you know, you know, what does that you know, look like at the family level and what yeah. does that mean? And does it really get us to where we're planning on going? And so part of the challenge when we get to the executive SNOP meeting, we see some of those disconnects. It's because other parts of the planning process are often broken. In other words, we're not doing a good job of managing our past due backlog. We're not, you know, and 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 that is also something that should be very obvious in the meeting. And I would say mm-hmm. on many of the SNOP journeys that we go through, that's a big chunk of them in the first year is getting those aha moments around data yeah. that says, oh, crap, you know, I, <laughs> I'm i looking at You can't at have it. a negative inventory plan for the next 12 months. Like that, that can't work. keep showing up every every month. That's not a plan. That's a... Right. That's not a plan. We can't so, plan so, Yeah. So that's a big thing. Um, just just to quickly put this through on the data side of things, and, and, and I would just encourage anybody, I'm mm-hmm. not going to spend a lot of time on this here. But one of the big things for us is in order to think about constraining, it means your SNOP families need to be by constraint. They need to be defined below the line here because Mm -hmm. this is, you know, when I start to get into those decisions around how am I going to allocate scarce resources, be that uh, my, my people, be that money around inventory, um, investment in in machines. Um, my families are are related to the constraints, and then I use demand streams to look at this above the line. And those demand streams are some consolidation of a level of customers. I'm going to show you that in a minute. So um, the d- above the line is how do we face the market? That's the model, and that's where the yep. demand streams. That's the the objects in that model that are that are that are uh, being used. And then on below the line, we're looking at not like theory of constraints, constraints, but macro constraints, like value streams or lines in plants. And I mean, products that are product categories, even, I mean, that kind of stuff. So it it may make sense, Marshall, if I'm just going to flip over to an actual SNOP sheet here, if that makes sense. And then we can kind of, we can pull it up and look at it. So, and, and um, I'm just going to, this is actually taken from uh, a customer that we've been working with um, back as of their April SNOP, but I think it'll probably describe a little bit of what we're looking for. So it, we talked about the five section sheet uh, in the past. Mm-hmm. Marshall, you mentioned the, you know, when I think about demand, I've really got the, the bookings aspect, which is order inflow. I've got my shipments, which is order outflow. And I've got my uh, backlog. Um, which really comes in in two pieces. One is kind of the age backlog when I have orders for, and then I right have now, my yeah. to- then I have my total backlog. Down here I have my production, my supply plan, and then down here I have inventory. Just so, to be clear on the aged backlog, I know some folks if you don't use it, that's that's the current month plan backlog spread out over uh, the next 
however many months you're, you're spreading it. Right. The easiest way to think about that is take all of your open orders and, and put them in the month in which you've actually promised them to be shipped. And we use promise date because if you think about the SNOP process and taking control of the business, right, promise date I control, yeah. right? I can't control the request date from my customer. Right. And I always, I get in some interesting arguments about that. You know, well, we recommend to, you, you track both, right? but not right. necessarily. You, yeah. you track both, but you have to fix your promise date service levels before you pick, fix your request date service levels. Right. Right. And, and a lot of people get that wrong. Yeah. Right. And and it is part of the role of of um, those demand streams, because if I've got a group of customers that I have a certain amount of lead time for. Right. Um, I might do a better job of establishing their promise dates versus ones that have a, maybe a shorter lead time that I've got in a group. Um, and so it is one of those things that I when you start to put those metrics together, kind of important um, to how you look at that. But if so you what- look at. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Yep. I was just saying, walk us through the constraining, you know, the, the unconstrained, yeah. the constraining view logic here. I think that'd be very, I think that's, that's what this is for. Um, I think yeah, be absolutely. Helpful. So, so um, you'll have to excuse me because I I might be looking over to the left while I'm talking a little bit. Sure. So not, not that I'm just gazing off into the, right. into the sunset, my screens over there. So, um, <laughs> so if you look at it, I've got my, my booking plan and I've got my shipment plan. And right now those are both, I'm going to call them unconstrained. And if I did a, uh, if I did a, a shipment drill down on that, you would actually see I've got four demand streams that make that up. And mm-hmm. one is all other customers. And then down here, you can see I've got really three large customers. And you can see I'm actually tracking the actual shipments compared to the plan for each month. I have the backlog for that customer. And I also have the, um, I also have the forward-looking plan and a comparison to the last plan. You can okay. see right now, we did not constrain our plan last month, um, and we haven't constrained it yet this month. If I so, so how did I know I needed to constrain? If I go back to the five-section sheet here, I know because I have this negative inventory number. Mm-hmm. I can see this graphically as well by looking at my inventory line and seeing that it is below the negative, right? So I've got a, got a problem. You can see I've developed, I've got a, a backlog profile based on my bookings and my shipments. By the mm-hmm. way, in this case, we have sales forecasting the shipments and we're using lead time offsets for the customers to calculate what does that turn into in booking. So in other words, if the customer has a three month lead time, whatever we plan to ship in three months, we would expect to be booking that in this in this current month. That makes sense, yeah. right? Um, so, so what I'm going to do is if I go back to the five section sheet, um, I, I'm, I'm actually going to go to the demand input here and I'm going to pull up my constraining demand stream. So in this case, in our, our current tool set, the way that we use it right now, I'm actually going to just enter a single uh, constraint here. And, and by the way, just to make this really easy, I, I went ahead and figured it out before we got in here because I, I didn't want to run through the math with everybody as I was as I was working on that. So um, I'm just going to copy this over from another spreadsheet I have here. Hopefully this works. Nope. Clearly <laughs> a user error. Always a glitch. Uh, let me try that it's one more usually, time. Just, yeah. Yeah. There we go. So I don't know if you can see those numbers very easily, Mm -hmm. but I basically have constrained the first month by about 9,700 units. If you go to the five section sheet, you can see that I had a negative 96. So I knew that's what I want. Now this negative number is cumulative as you go forward. So I went ahead and figured out, okay, so this is what I need to do. I'm gonna take some out of the first month, out of the third and the fourth month, and I'm going to put it back in. The goal being that when I constrain, I want the sum of the constraints to be zero. I'm basically almost peanut buttering my demand a little yeah. bit, you know, going forward. I'm going to enter that. I mean, those are the constraints in your supply chain. You can't 
you can't make the math better. You can just move the where the, the where the numbers uh, where the numbers go by month based on uh, right what you're going to be able to you know produce right. And 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 there might be some room if you look at this. I might have been mm-hmm. able to play a little bit with my production because I'm under my capability. But if you look yeah. at this first part of the the plan, this is really frozen based on their supply chain lead time. So everything yeah. here is dependent on incoming uh, um, uh, um, components that are, yeah. yeah. And, and then um, this is really frozen. Their supply chain actually goes out as far as January. So we're sitting here in April. You know, they're, they're a good uh, 10, 9, 10 months of supply chain lead time. Mm-hmm. So, so when you're looking at that, I have some flexibility out of here, but I'm already within my lead time. So I could have maybe played with that and I might have some room out here, but I can tell you we've been spending a lot of time um, uh, with them just in trying to get a good view of the plan um, based on what the supply chain constraints are. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reload this uh, same uh, five section sheet and you're going to see the difference of me putting in that constraint. So as I said, I kind of figured it out ahead of time yeah. to run me as close to zero inventory as possible. And those those decisions would be made in the in the uh, supply and the pre SNOP meetings, basically. Well, yeah, and ideally, you're kind of coming to the pre SNOP meeting with a proposal, not yeah. necessarily figuring that all out in there. Because you know, if you yeah. think about it, large organization, it might have seven or eight people in the room. That discussion, I mean, in some places, that is the discussion, right? So the the first the first view where we had negative inventory, that might be what you end up with at the beginning of the supply meeting. By the end of the supply meeting would be kind of ideally where you're going with this as a proposal right. to take into the pre-SNOP meeting and then hash out eventually, and we'll get to this, where which demand streams are going to be affected by the constraints. Right. Perfect. Because if I look at it, right, so I've now constrained this. So if we look at the graphical five section sheet, yeah, right, you can see I no longer have that negative inventory. I got inventory climbing up here, but I'm not too worried about this yet. Right. Yeah. We're, we're missing part of our if you look, our demand plans coming down. And that is something they're grappling with is how do we they're, extend their bookings demand? is sunsetting with their fiscal year instead of. Yeah, um, absolutely. Continuing on a rolling 12, which we would not recommend either. But, you know, yep. it is what it is. But if you remember what this backlog profile looked like, it kind of went up and then it went down. Well, now mm-hmm. we're having a situation where we're holding more backlog. Uh, right. as we go. So the question, the first question is, you know, when you constrain, where does the difference go? Well, the difference goes to yeah, backlog. It's not just a spreadsheet. There's somebody that's going <laughs> to, somebody's getting yeah. affected. Yeah, well, so the first part is in aggregate, it goes to my backlog. So if you look at it, if I'm shipping somewhere out here, I'm getting close to 20,000. In June, I'm really sitting on about five months of backlog. Right. Right. So we we constrained shipments. We kept bookings on the unconstrained. And now what we've got is this difference showing up in backlog. Now, that obviously introduces a risk to the business, right? Because- Mm -hmm. As lead times stretch out, it might mean someone can't is or is not, you know, they're going to maybe uh, go to someone else, right? Uh, a competitor. Yeah. Everybody that's right why there's now. There's a pre SNOP meeting because that's that's where that gets flushed. Right, exactly. And those are some of the things that go into the strategic decisions about who do we ship to, right? So yeah. going to where you were talking about is if I do that shipment drill down again, you can see I've now got this where I've, I've, you know, constrained really in the first, you know, four months, I've actually constrained my plan by about 32,000 units. That yeah. means in this period of time, one of these four demand buckets is not going to get everything that they want. So what's, what's forcing, we're forced, we're being forced to answer at least two questions. The first is, Who's being affected by the constraint? Which clients, which yep. demand streams, you know, which clients within which demand streams, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the second I get the question, I guess, that we we might answer separate from that would be, do we even want to do this? Do we should we actually just stop taking orders from people if we can't deliver them within a reasonable period of time? 
And then a third question would be, how do we fix the supply side? But you're not going to do that overnight. And that's often right. why Beza and DBM work together initially. I would be brought in. Uh, we would we would do bottleneck breaking and increase you know capacity by thirty percent in in six months or something. But the reason they knew they needed to do that is they saw the big lump in the snake coming down in predict in their in their bookings, uh, and they knew that they weren't going to be able to digest that without increasing their their supply chain capacity. And somehow that had to get done. And you know it was a non trivial thing to do. But they had an intact uh, working SNOP process that was constraining, as, as part of the plans, constraining their shipments. And uh, yep. to me, that's that's pretty critical. What we haven't talked about is the basis for how you decide those, because that that that's that's the story of the business that you got to figure out on your own. And everybody's got different ways of thinking about that. One of the ways that I think is a great way to to kind of make some decisions to, to provide some intel on those types of decisions is to use what what we call uh, as a net landed profit analytics. So we take a look at the actual net landed profit by SKU and by customer and by customer SKU and by, you know, color. And we just look at contributions of profit at a very micro level to kind of pinpoint some actions we could take in the short term to maybe um, use profit impact as part of our decision ma matrix in terms of the risk we have in extending lead times or any of that stuff. Watch next week uh, on the 31st, we've got a live stream with Richard Sharp on net, net landed profit analytics, but just a little plug for next week. Yeah. But in the meantime, I think what what we're seeing here is clearly um, the reality we're talking about in the first four principles. Like you have to make, you have to address the reality and make the decisions that this is calling for. Yeah, it's it, and and I agree totally with your your comments that you know you you, you know there's the. There's, there's always the, it's a very emotional decision when you're going to put somebody on allocation, right? But it, it, it also needs to be a business decision. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you get five different people in the room and you'll have five different, you know, <laughs> uh, arguments as to who it should be. One of the big things to start to look at is, you know, do you have a customer that's got like lumpy demand? You know, right. if you're, you're supplying to an OEM, who's got a production line that your product goes into and you see that kind of lumpy demand, that's usually an opportunity to work through some demand smoothing to buy yourself yeah. some capability because it just might be their buying patterns. And so it goes back to that whole thing about those demand streams is sometimes we get so down into the weeds thinking customer right. by customer by customer that if you kind of think about this, I mean, the example I had had really, you know, four, three large customers and all other, but you might be looking at your OEMs, you might be looking at your distributors, and then you might be looking at, you know, your, your small customers, and then you overlay on top of that profitability on that. And I mean, ultimately, it's things like what alternatives do they have? Is it a captive market for us, right? Those yeah. are the kind of things that you want to at least be seeing. And it's really driven us. the The tool that I'm showing right now is the we're we're working through a lot of that constraining process to improve that piece of the tool because yeah. to force we're, you we're, to make the decision. Well, right, and we're we're two years into three, you know, at least two years into this, yeah. um, and um, it's changed my thought process on on how and important that is. To be clear, when you say we're into this, we're, we're talking specifically about constraining logic yes. and yeah. and how does you how do you flush that back into the demand stream? How do you go back above the line and say, okay, which of these un, unconstrained demand streams are now going to have to be constrained, and who within them are is going to be constrained? Right. The 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 worst thing that can happen to you is you have a demand meeting, or sorry, you have the SNOP meeting. The day after that, you get three sales guys calling to the you know operations and saying, "I need you to do this, right? This customer's on the phone because it's the one that's on the phone, <laughs> right? At that time, that's the most important one, and it's tough to say no. I mean, I yep, I've been there, right? It's tough to say no to that customer, right? Um, and 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 that has to be a strategic decision, or you're going to get these. The, the points where you're, you're, you're basically kind of bouncing against each other and yeah. not, not getting there. So hopefully that answered those questions on, yeah. it should be clear if you need to constrain demand, it should be clear if you've constrained demand in the past, 
It should be really clear um, on what decisions you have to make on how you're going to constrain the demand. Right. And then it, it really should be clear what the the impact of that constraining is. So who is going to be constrained? Yes. Maybe. We're really is, yeah. What, who is it going to be constrained? And I mean, ultimately, you start constraining a lot. Yeah. Um, and what starts to become obvious if you hold that bookings plan as to where sales thinks it could be, at some point in time, and, and we saw this uh, in the SNOP meeting this morning, you know, they're, they are at risk with some customers because lead times just keep pushing out. And yeah. so and they're not, it is how do we, right. So now we've really got to, you know, manage that as we go through. So hopefully that was helpful to go through a pretty complex topic in this time. I mean, I'm always, yeah. you know, people have questions, you know, feel free to email me or, or get a hold of Marshall. Well, let's, um, we're, yeah. We're kind of out of time, but let's consider continuing this conversation, maybe doing some more examples and um, specifically getting into some of the the more advanced constraining logic by demand stream, because that's where we've been, folks, is we've been talking about how your demand streams model, your unconstrained demand, and it flows into the SNOP process. Now we, we, we looked at how to constrain by family that stuff, but we haven't looked at how to flush that back to the demand stream. So if, yep. if Doug's up for it, we, we can maybe do that next time. <laughs> I'm always <laughs> up to talk about any topic on SNOP. You know that, Marshall. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again, folks, for joining us again on SNOP Thursday, the second and fourth Thursday of every month. Uh, the next one will be um, June. Yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you can probably figure out what the second uh, Thursday in June is, and we'll We'll continue with uh, talking about demand streams and how they intersect with a good SNOP process. Thanks again, Doug. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time. Bye now.